Welcome to the Art of Living podcast. I'm Zafar Majid, and today we have a very special program with a special guest. And uh, today's program is about drug addiction. This sort of addiction which is blighting people's lives and families. Families are uh, falling apart. It's actually destroying relationships and it's destroying our communities as well. And why is today's program so special? Because my guest, Ejaz Hussain, who I'll be introducing uh, shortly, is a former drug addict who is going to tell us about his journey from drug addiction to recovery to rehabilitation, how he is now planning on giving back into the community from his experience as a drug addict, a reformed drug addict. So welcome to Ejaz Hussain. How are you? Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Fine. Thank you. Thank, thank you for coming. And today, as I said, it's a very special program because when I met you recently and you told me your story, how you got into drugs and the journey you went through and how, alhamdulillah, you have now sort of uh, recovered, you're clean and you have great plans to help other drug addicts as well. So let's hear from yourself in the first instance. How did you get into drugs? From the start? <laughs> It's, uh, it was a very long journey for myself. Um, if I go back in time, I think we're going back to 92 or 93. It was probably the first time um, I was actually introduced to drugs, mm -hmm. um, which I'd say was at a lower scale than at, the, at cannabis stage. So um, I still actually remember, as we discussed before, my first actual interaction with cannabis was mm -hmm. on a, a very rainy, lame day when I didn't want to go to school. Uh, and I was actually late for school, walking to school, and um, I did smoke at that time, smoking cigarettes. We used to buy the singles from the, the shop for about 10 to so, 15 So feet. smoking cigarettes is the first step? That was definitely the first step from where it built up. And that might, the cigarette might have been the actual reason for me to have smoked this cannabis, because uh, on the way to school, I met another friend who was much older than me, and he approached me and he says, he just asked, can I have a cigarette? So out of normality, I just gave him a cigarette and he says, well, wait, we'll walk together. So he made me wait with him while he actually made a weed, a, a spliff of uh, cannabis. And I'm out of curiosity, like, whoa, what's going on here? I've never seen this before. So what are you doing? I'll just wait, just wait. So I'm waiting anxiously. Uh, so he's made it and he smoked it. And the smell was, I wouldn't say sweet, but it was intriguing. It was like, you know, what's it, what is this? What's going on? So he gave me a few drugs, uh, had a few drugs and nothing I felt immediately, but on the way to school, it was phew, euphoria. It was just another, I was on another level, I was on another cloud. Uh, this is not going to be a, an advert for cannabis. It's not, no, it's <laughs> not, no, it's not, no, but it was, it was just totally, um, I was out of it. I didn't know what was going on, the surroundings. In fact, it was so bad uh, that in school, while I was in school, the, the, the lunch break bell rang and I thought it was home time. So I've now started walking down the football fields on my way to home and then realizing I'm the only one that's actually walking down the field. Where is everybody else? And when I look back, everybody's got their sorry, face screwed, uh, glued to the windows. Like, Where's the jars going? Where's the jars going? And I'm like, oops, something's wrong. <laughs> so it just really, really took me uh, for a six. Uh, not a good experience. Uh, and uh, definitely would advise it upon anybody. And what about, uh, how did you actually get into the hardcore drugs? Hardcore drugs came, uh, I think, uh, on a late, in a later stage uh, in my life. Uh, at that time, I was probably about 16, 17. Um, I re got reintroduced to drugs uh, again in boarding school and a few years later um, left the boarding school. Again, it was just cannabis. But I think the hardcore drugs came when I was actually uh, in, in a new environment, when I left the boarding school and I met the big wide world, new culture, new society, new people in college life, uh, and I got introduced to alcohol and then cannabis, and then from there it just escalated to cocaine. But cocaine wasn't as. Something interesting you mentioned when we were off is that this was a. Uh, an Islamic boarding school that you were This in. was, this was so this Islamic. This was quite shocking for me to hear that there was a quite a, a rampant drug culture in there. There was. What the problem actually was, um, I think in, in that era, um, our parents, obviously from back home, um, 
not much education, um, no facilities or uh, any any way to actually deal with a drug addiction or children behaving badly, etc. So they thought, okay, boarding school, send the child there, they will sort him out. But actually, in the boarding school, don't forget, we had people coming from all cultures, all societies, all backgrounds, the good ones, the bad ones. Uh, and uh, Maybe it was all the rebellious kids that the parents threw Just like boarding. myself, just like myself, I was one of them rebellious ones as well, so I actually got forced to go to the boarding school, and just like many other children did as well. And then with them came their habits, and came their addictions, and uh, came other things. So I'm very sorry. It's your phone day. That's my it. alarm, sorry for the no mask. Uh, yeah, so with them came all, all, all the drugs and the addicts with them, and then I got reintroduced um, to cannabis again there, and, and from there it just escalated, uh, and uh, it became normal. It, it became a, a way of uh, dealing with the pressure uh, of being in boarding school. And I didn't, didn't like it. I didn't like it. I didn't like it. Not to say the education wasn't good, it was just I was forced to, to go there and I didn't like so it. Take, take me through at uh, what stage an age did you get into the hard sort of drugs like cocaine? I would say at the age of, give it about 19, 20. Okay, so it's quite about, an early age then. Yeah, 19, 20. And how did you get introduced to that? Uh, first it was alcohol, again, weed became, uh, cannabis became social, um, everybody was doing it everywhere you went. From there alcohol got introduced, from there parties and going out. Uh, and then you get introduced to different drugs. Ecstasy was a, a big thing in that era. It was cheap, it was affordable. Um, it, and then cocaine itself as well. It wasn't as cheap, but it was uh, widely available. So we got introduced to them kind of things. And from there, it just led on. Every event, uh, going to snooker, going to play uh, football or something, was like, let's have a few drinks and let's, uh, let's get high, basically. So all our life evolved around getting high. And how much do you think that was as a result of peer pressure? Or do you think that uh, it was something that you desired yourself or it was the external influence? Originally, I would say it was something which we just desired ourselves. It yeah. came about socially. From there, as time went on, as I grew older, more responsibilities came about. Um, marriage, etc., education, work. Uh, so it, it automatically became a coping mechanism to deal with the uh, small pressures and anxiety and depression. Uh, but it's, it, it's important to know that do you say, I mean, I hear this a lot. People take alcohol to drown their sorrows or numb their pain. Does it actually work? Temporarily, yes. Temporarily, okay. yes. Uh, that's the reason many people resort to alcohol, you'll see more alcohol uh, addiction, even though people will admit it's an addiction, they'll think it's just a normal thing, we'll go for a drink and it just, uh, people do use it, but the problem is, after they've used it, the come down of it is actually twice as worth, because then you've got the problem of thinking, hold on a minute, what have I just done? Yeah, the and regret. The regret of actually doing the act itself, mm -hmm. and then realizing the problem. You haven't, really, yeah, <laughs> you haven't really solved the problem. The of problem course. is still there, but if not now, worse, because you've had that time period of not thinking of how to sort, sort it out or resolve the problem, rather than just putting it in the wardrobe and then realizing it's, it's trying to kick itself out of the wardrobe and it comes out flying and you've got to deal with the double pressure then. Mm -hmm. So no, it, it really doesn't help, but temporarily, mm -hmm. it just... It, people use it for, for that reason, yeah. At what stage would you say that you realised that you were an addict? Oh, this was probably much later in life. Um, I think I probably realised I was an addict of cannabis. Okay. Um, so you were smoking that every day? I was smoking that every day. That, like I said, that had just become a norm for me. People would smoke a cigarette, I would probably smoke cannabis. In fact, I'd smoke more cannabis than cigarette. I thought, well, what's the point of smoking a cigarette from the smoke cannabis so it became it just became part of me uh, the addiction realization i think came on a much much later uh, time when i actually uh, realized right i actually need help here that, when was that what, how old were you then that, that probably a couple of years ago to be honest only with a, couple you. Of years a couple ago. of years ago but that's you told me you were an addict for more than 20 years but the problem is we don't admit we're an addict so this is a classic syndrome of uh, denial. That denial, definitely. Happen. Every addiction, the key or the ground of it is denial. We live in denial. We live a secret life. We hide. Nobody knows about it. In fact, we don't admit it ourselves. 
uh, that's all a problem. Um, you know, for example, I realise I'm consuming too much alcohol now. Oh, I'll stop. Oh, I'll stop. Oh, I'll stop. Oh, I'll stop. But you stop doesn't actually stop until you actually go and stop it. Mm -hmm. So you keep giving yourself fake reassurance that I'll stop and it's not controlling my life. Oh, I only have it here and there. But next thing you know, you're overboard. So, what exactly were you addicted to? Was it alcohol? Was it drug? Cocaine? What was it? I my addiction from cannabis led to alcohol, led to cocaine. Uh, with cannabis uh, uh, still there, uh, crystal meth. Um, it, it, it got it got that bad. It really got that bad. You say you didn't realize you're an addict, but those around you, the family, they can obviously see that you. This person is coming home legless, stumbling through the front door so there is surely a problem here did they not detect that that's that's the problem you see yeah. i mean i see this happening a lot in asian families and uh, asian backgrounds is we we hide we hide and do things for example like you just mentioned walking stumbling through the door we'll probably wait till everybody's asleep yeah you will have the back door key yeah, um, surely look all the other telltale signs of that you'll probably smell you yes yes disorientated and uh, my family you're not working yeah my family was aware there's yeah. an issue they wanted to address it but the problem is how do we address it except for confronting myself and then to confront myself because i was under intoxication i wasn't thinking straight you lose a couple of capability of making the decisions right decisions um your ego takes over you become a demanding person you become a control freak of yourself yeah. Uh, you think every situation you can handle, you're handling yourself, you're handling everything around you, but you're actually not. So therefore, you refuse to take any so you help. You refuse help. You refuse any help. You refuse any any positive advice. Anybody looking to recognize what's wrong with you, you'll just avoid it. You'll stay. You'll actually avoid them people. So people then, what do they do? How does it affect the family? They avoid the family. They avoid the loved ones. They'll avoid the mother and father causing domestics, causing a breakdown in a relationship, it happens with the wife, it happens with the children. Uh, and these are the main reasons because you're, you're trying to hide, even though they know. But the, ma but the sort of majority of that time of your addiction, you were actually married and had young children who are probably yes. grown up now. Yes, alhamdulillah, I have four beautiful children now, uh, still married with my wife. Um, they definitely, definitely affect them. In fact, my children now, after this rehabilitation and after being this new person, can actually see the difference between me then and now. Obviously, uh, Alhamdulillah, and they're like, you know, you're much calmer, you think, you give us good advice. Um, and I feel it myself as well. Uh, before, I was very rational, uh, very irrational. irrational, sorry, irrational, very judgmental. Um, anger was on the tip of my nose. I, my, I just couldn't deal with the normal so, pressures. So you were a nasty person to live with. I was a mean <laughs> little boy, yeah. I was a mean little boy, yes. I was. Uh, but alhamdulillah. But how, do you, how do you think your wife coped through that? Very difficult. Mm -hmm. Very difficult. Um, alhamdulillah. Um, I can only praise her and say good things. She had a very tough time, but I don't think she gave up. She... Um, it got to the point where she just had to accept who I was uh, and uh, she tried her best to, I mean, well, she saw the flaws. She definitely saw the flaws and over time, uh, I've been married for 22 years now, alhamdulillah, so over the period of this journey, she did see the difference in character, in myself, uh, and it, we did get to some really, really bad patches because of this, but alhamdulillah, she stuck by me until today, she's still with me. See, it's very important that addicts have loving, supporting family members who can uh, basically take them to rehabilitation. Because if they don't, they can end up on the streets, homeless. They can end up, you know, begging on the streets and basically in that state where there is no sort of turning around for them. And no doubt you must have seen many people who have gone through that stage. Definitely, definitely. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I had family around me. I had my sisters, my brother. Uh, my mother, my wife, uh, who would support me, who, who did care about me, who were concerned about my well-being, mm -hmm. uh, who did make an effort. It was me as an individual who didn't actually recognize uh, the, 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 the work that they were actually doing with me and wanting to me to rehabilitate and sort myself out. So, uh, but that is a key for any rehabilitation. 
a loving family, loving support, realizing that, hold on, there is actually somebody who cares whether I exist or don't exist. There's somebody there who I can make a difference to. And the problem with some society or some families is people don't have that support. Yeah. Or it could be that the family give up on a certain member of the family who's addicted. They kick him out of the house or her out of the house and say, look, we don't want to deal with your problems. Don't bring this trouble to our house. And they've left them off to fend for themselves. Again, I think the, the actual problem is the families fail to realise that this person is an addict. Yeah. So they don't they don't pay attention to the addiction and the cause of the addiction. Yeah, but look, families will go through a huge period of frustration as well, where if they want to help you, as you said yourself, you turned out to, you were turning uh, out to be like this really mean, nasty kind of a person. Definitely where you had your real anger management issues. So they'd be hesitant to approach you. So if they can't get to you to get you to cooperate so that you need to seek help, then what are they meant to do? That's the problem. Um, there's lack of um, information available, should I say. Yeah. Uh, people don't actually bother researching for any counseling sessions, any anger management sessions. Uh, anything as such people don't know how to deal with the situation i mean if there's an angry person on the other side and the other one the other one becomes angry as well you've got a full-on fight okay so now would you say you can you can be called an expert on how to deal with these uh, people with addictions so I'm, I'm probably not an expert but you can give advice how to deal with them yeah, definitely we'll, we'll, we'll touch upon that but what i want to focus on is Let's focus within our own Asian communities even for a moment. How much of a big problem is this drug addiction? Or any kind of addiction that could be alcohol? Yeah, one, one thing we have to recognize, uh, addiction, it comes in many forms and shapes. Yeah. I mean, there's alcohol, there's uh, people with obesity problems who have eating addiction, yeah. uh, alcohol addiction, etc. Uh, the problem actually, as we discussed before, uh, the problem actually lies within our society is it's a hidden society we live in mm -hmm. i mean for somebody who's not a drug addict who's never had uh, interaction with anybody any people who actually take drugs uh, or be in that kind of environment it'll, it'll be difficult for them to recognize for somebody for my, like myself i mean two glances and i'll know right that person takes some sort of drugs really? or, yeah he's on some sort of drugs or he's it like, takes one to know one it take, <laughs> definitely it, it takes one to know one that that's exactly it and uh, we actually well they now not me now uh, actually live in a hidden society we have a hidden agendas we have hidden uh, let's say little spots where we'll go uh, and then when as soon as some we're back in the big wild world we're hiding it's role playing we actually play a role it happens within the household it happens at work so we try and say that we hide it under the carpet, as I say this. Problem. Definitely, definitely, definitely. I've known people while I was university, even like myself, we'd go out, we'd have a drink, we'd take some drugs, we're in the lecture with a bright student, we're like, but nobody knows anything. When we go home, just like the same, they go home, they try playing their father role, the brother role, the mother role, whatever role they're playing, but they're not playing the addiction role, they're leaving that away. Yeah, but if they're addicted, how can they hide that? This is what I'm asking. They think. Eh? We think we can hide it. People see. Well, ultimately, it. catches up. With ultimately, you. it always catches up on you. It's. It, I mean, it, if somebody's not normal, yeah. you you want to click on straight away. Hold on a minute. There's nothing normal about this guy. There's something weird about this guy. There's something you know not two and two is not making four here. It's all adding up to five. So it's visible. Uh, you'll come to a point where it's visible, but then it's too late. So when you so you say when you see people. And you can easily tell that somebody has some sort of an addiction of some sort. Yeah, I think 75 to 80% I'd, I'd recognize. And would you say, it may sound like a silly question, but the, your answer is it may be obvious, that between the time when you were growing up and now, has that problem increased or is it still relatively the same or has it even decreased this increased level of addiction? dramatically. Really? Dramatically. Um, I actually got shocked, to be honest with you. I came, when I came back from Pakistan, from this rehabilitation and... Um, oh, so you were rehabilitated in Pakistan? I was rehabilitated in Pakistan, so I will touch upon that. But I just want to give you a little... Uh, okay. uh, um, because I'd been away from England for about four or five years, and uh, I've come out of the house now for a cigarette, so I'm standing at my doorstep. Yeah. Masjid is 15, 20 houses away from my house. Uh, and this young kid 
with a hood walks across my house and he saw smoking as well and as he went past I got a whiff of what he was smoking and it was cannabis so I called him and I recognized the kid and I said what are you doing you're smoking cannabis on the street and he goes oh come on uncle everybody smokes here what's going on <laughs> and I was like where have I been <laughs> you know what have I missed what's going on it's that widely and openly smoked it. it's yeah. unbelievable because we now get a whiff of cannabis everywhere whenever yeah. you're walking through yeah. the public street somebody drives past with their window down yeah. you get that whiff and i know when i was certainly growing up and the kids my age in my school used to go to the local paper shop on the way to school and buy a single yeah yeah and yeah that, at the time i remember it was a long time ago they spent about 10 pence for a single exactly car. and even then they would dare not smoke that in public in case any of the elders see them because they had that fear of authority. They had that respect for the elders. But now, what I find, people are openly smoking, openly taking cannabis, and openly, probably no doubt, taking drugs and uh, alcohol as well. Openly, leave openly. They actually sat in their households smoking and drinking alcohol and smoking cannabis. It's well, in front of their families. In front of their families. I have been to many... Um, friends who were still smoking and yeah. their children sat in the living room and they're smoking cannabis I'm like really scratching my head thinking what are you doing man do you remember the days when we used to go so far and he goes oh come on Jesse grow up man grow up man you know everybody's smoking it and I'm like what, what, what is actually going on here it has become a norm of life it has become a social drug I know it's not our topic today but uh, I was talking to somebody else about those gas canisters how they've become so popular now and so widely used that even I have been told we, uh, we will be doing a program on this that kids even girls as young as 10 and 12 are taking those gas canisters definitely I mean I just had a, a conversation with my brother-in-law a few days ago and we were discussing this while his daughter was in the car we just picked her up from school uh, and um, it, out, out of nowhere this discussion came up about drugs uh, and uh, we started discussing this this gas problem with these yeah. balloons. Yeah. So we're like, what is this? What are they actually using? Because I was it was so I was totally oblivious to this, uh, to as in what they were, the substance that they were using. So it turned out to be they're using nitrous oxide. Yeah. Uh, and my niece, his daughter, she's like, oh yeah, everybody in schools on it. They've all got balloons and they go around the. And we both turned our head like this, all like, and she's Marshall, she's fifteen years old, and we just turned our head thinking. You want it? And she's like, no, 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 obviously not, alhamdulillah. But we were shaking our head that kids in school at exactly, lunchtime and break exactly time. exactly what I've heard. And we'll be covering that in a future program that kids, girls, you know, normally we think about drug abuse and intoxication, especially, you know, drugs. You think it's associated with the male gender, the boys, oh, young no. boys. But now young girls are actually on this sort of substance abuse, unfortunately. When it comes to drugs, uh, sex, culture, religion, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. There's no boundaries. Really? Everybody is in the same boat. Everybody's sailing in the same ship. There's no captain. They're all the captains. Okay. So tell us how did that road to recovery start? It was a very, very tough road. Um, I, I left England and um, we had some family problems issues um, where the whole family came under a lot of strain and pressure uh, during that time my mother actually had a stroke and um, so that even put more pressure on the family mm -hmm. um, we were all dealing with our pressures our depression our anxiety in different ways obviously mine was drugs and alcohol um, and mine just escalated and escalated because of sheer pressure mm -hmm of the, everything that was going wrong i just couldn't couldn't oh. take it mm -hmm. I, I couldn't I, it was my only coping mechanism drugs and alcohol eventually my mother passed away um and life just became a mess for me i, I was i was in no i had no direction of life whatsoever i didn't know what to do and so the way i thought i would get away with this is by leaving everything here i'll leave my problems here and I'll go to Pakistan, I'll have a fresh start, clear head, clear mind, leave so the kids and family. Own. So I went on my own, I left the kids family. I thought, just time to think. The problem was, I did leave all my problems here, but I took that alcohol, the and the addictions went with me. 
So yes, I've left the worldly things that happen to me, but I didn't realize I'm taking my addiction, my alcohol, my cocaine and my cannabis with me. So is it easier to fulfill your addictions? In there, it, that's when it, I really hit the fan. That's where everything went off the roof. In Pakistan, got money, got a car, no one to answer to, no kids to drop off at school and pick up. Um, don't have to come home at any time. I'm just totally free bird. Drugs, alcohol available absolutely just like in England, every street corner. Easier to obtain? Very, very easier and very, very cheaper. It is mayhem. Really? Uh, Pakistan is not the same Pakistan it used to be. It is modernized, the culture is totally westernized, it's just totally a different world. Um, again, I don't think people see that side of Pakistan it's because a of, hidden part it's of a hidden part. I mean, as you go to the cities uh, and the bigger areas, the more uh, richer areas, shall we say, it's a norm, but as we live in the villages and the rural areas, it's... it's, it's but then surely away. they can't be protected from it. No, they, it's, it's more hidden there. In the cities, it's more open. Really? But in the villages... Well, it's openly and, consuming alcohol. Openly consuming alcohol, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable how, how widely it's available. Now the crystal meth is, uh, is uh, on top of the market. It's absolutely going crazy. For the crazy. benefit of our viewers, what exactly is crystal meth? Crystal meth is a very bad drug, to be honest with you. It's a crystal, basically. Uh, it's, it's high is like a cocaine high, like mm -hmm. an ecstasy high. Mm -hmm. um, it can keep you up for... I mean, I remember staying up for 11 days constantly. While, without sleeping? Without sleeping, while I was on crystal meth. 11 days, no sleep, hardly any food, and just continuously on the go, on the go, on the go, on the go. You become a machine, you become alert, you become alive. Uh, sleep, uh, tiredness, it just all just leaves you. Uh, it's it's not what you want. Uh, it, how is it consumed? It's consumed by uh, a, a small um, a pipe. Yeah. Okay. A hookah pipe, as we as we say, so a water pipe okay. uh, and shisha pipe. So it's put in a little glass tube, burnt, turned into a liquid, and then uh, you keep on. So you're able to get that easily in Pakistan. Very easily. It's available really? everywhere. It's available more than cannabis and alcohol is available. Wow. It, it's it's really gone through the roof in Pakistan. Uh, everybody's on it. Ladies, boys, doctors, solicitors, policemen, you name it. Everybody is on it. It's like a coping mechanism. People are definitely, definitely using that. Uh, and uh, yeah, and it's just smoked through the pipe and there's no smell to it. There's no um, like uh, visual uh, signs. Visual signs. Yeah, visual signs. signs yeah. yeah, as if it's somebody smoking it or not smoking it, except for eventually when it's not. Meant when people talk about addictions, the first thing that comes to mind for the majority of people is that typical image of a heroin addict. Oh, no. No. Uh, addiction does relate to heroin and uh, crack addicts, but no. Uh, I mean, you've got cannabis addicts, you've got crystal meth addicts, alcohol addicts, you've got people on painkiller addicts who are using painkillers, yeah. people are using horse tranquilizers. It, but would you say, what's the, what's the, um, the drug of the rich or elite it's i mean drugs now is has come to such a large variety it suits everybody it's available for every market so if he was the elite mm -hmm. um i don't think people are taking crystal meth they're taking uh, cocaine and everybody's going for the purest of the purest um gas alcohol and then kind of it, it's just whatever's available the problem is the poor people who can't afford it, what are they taking? Because the rich, they've got a variety, the doors are open to them, they so, can select. So what's the drug of the poor then? For the poor, I, I read in a newspaper that I think cough medicine has uh, some sort of drug in it in Pakistan. And rickshaw drivers who were earning like five, 600 rupees per day were buying these bottles for 40 rupees, 35 to 40 rupees. And they were consuming six to seven to eight bottles at a time just to get some sort of intoxication, some sort of That's hit. the whole day's earnings. That's the whole, exactly. But that's going down to the lowest of the lowest. Now, it makes you think, cough medicine, cough syrup? You're drinking, you're drinking eight bottles. Eight bottles of, of cough, cough medicine. Of cough medicine to actually get some sort of intoxication. Wow. So, I mean, how low do you want to go? So it seems like this addiction of some sort, it seems to be a lot more endemic than many people Defin would like to admit. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, so let's focus on your recovery then. So you're yeah. in Pakistan, it's got worse, 
But in the same place, it's where your rehabilitation started. Yes, I got to a point uh, where I did hit rock, rock bottom. Um, I want to, for the purpose of uh, our viewers, we're going to show this image now of what you look like just before you went into yeah, rehabilitation. Yeah, before I went to I mean, rehabilitation. I, I saw this picture, as you can see on the screen now, and it shows that you really were in a very bad state. I couldn't recognize myself. Um, there were times when I'd look in the mirror and I'd see, is this me? I, I mean, as you can see from the picture, a skeleton with just a bit of flesh over my face. Um, lost, I think at that time I was probably weighing 69 kgs. Wow. 69 to 70 kgs uh, at the time when I went into rehabilitation. And what I want to actually uh, mention to yourself is, it's easy saying when I went to rehabilitation, mm -hmm. the big question is how do you get to rehabilitation? Because first and first is you have to admit or somebody you has to recognize that there's a problem there that yeah. needs to be addressed and what mm -hmm. is the way we're going to address this problem. And uh, that, that is the key. Now, I, I, certain um, events took place in my life, as we mentioned before, uh, off screen, and uh, where I then actually called out for help. I actually rang my sister and I said, right, this is what's happened to me. It was an emotional breakdown. I was crying over the phone. Um, I was at the verge of really taking me on life, to be honest with you. Uh, is that then, typical? Addicts can get to the brink of definitely. suicide. Definitely, really? definitely. I actually got to the point of committing suicide myself. Uh, How were you thinking of going? I was going to jump off the balcony. I was really going to jump off the balcony. Um, it was an emotional conversation I had with my sister, telling her, right, I really need help. I cried out for help. Uh, they got very concerned. Uh, and then I just made the decision that you can't help me. Nobody can help me. Uh, I'm totally helpless. Uh, and it's better if I just end my life. Uh, and then at that point, I just hung up the phone. They continued ringing me, um, and I remember I actually. So she was she the only one who knew about your suicide. She experience? was the only one that actually at that time I discussed it with, um, and I thought right before anything happens, I just I just climbed over the balcony. It was like seven to eight floors up, um, and uh, I remember I just, I was too scared to actually look down, so I was looking straight forward. So somebody who's thinking of committing suicide. Exactly scared of it looking It does, at... yeah, it does. I mean, it, it, I was just looking for... Were you next... sober? I wasn't sober, no. I was definitely not sober. Uh, I was finding every excuse or reason in the book not to do this. <laughs> okay. Not somebody, please give me a sign. Somebody give me a reason not to do this. It's good to know that, that, you know, when we hear about people who are on the brink or they're hanging from the top of a, a building, that they really are looking for help. Definitely, There's definitely. Really yeah, you, you are you are going through absolutely every emotion, absolutely everything in your life, thinking, why should I not do this? Why should I not do? This? Not why should I do this? You don't think. Well, I mean, I I don't know about other people, but myself, I didn't think why should I do this? It was like why should I not do this? So what stopped you? Then? Somebody actually walked through the door uh, in the in the, in the flat I was in, uh, and they looked at me. Uh, they addressed and this addressed me. Um, they, I think they actually seen me that I was actually going to jump over the balcony, and then they turned away. And that got me. I says, "Why has this person turned away? Why has he not come running to me and tried saving me?" So I instantly climbed back over and I approached that person. Says, "Why have you not stopped me? What's wrong? Are you my worst enemy or something? Are you wanting to kill me?" And we actually. Uh, start fighting over there and it's like well i didn't know you're jumping over the balcony i thought you stood on this side of the balcony and i'm like no you knew i was going to jump over the balcony and you you walked away so that kind Sorry, of Sorry, <laughs> look at the funny side of yeah, that yeah i mean now it is now i see the funny side of it as well yeah. and i think yeah that was that the reason for me to not jump over and i i thought well you were you're trying to kill me it's all because of you and etc and I'm like, well i thought you stood on this side of the balcony and i was like you know so that was one of the reasons why I probably never jumped over to come back and ask, why have you not come and stopped me? <laughs> and then what happened? <coughs> Excuse me. So then he actually realized, they actually realized that this is what I was going to do. Yeah. Sat me down and then we just start talking and then we start taking more drugs and drinking more alcohol. And then I just down my sorrows with them. Um, and then family obviously ringing and then I answered, oh, I'm okay, I've not done nothing. And I reassured them I'm okay, I'm fine. So, I mean, 
At many points, family did reach out to me, but I just carried on reassuring them, I'm okay, I'm fine, my ego was too big, I can deal with it, I'm coping with it, it's fine, it's fine. Until later on then, I had a car accident mm. uh, on the motorway, again under the influence of drugs and alcohol. This was about 3 o'clock in the morning on the motorway, about 120 mile per hour, I lost control in Pakistan, in Pakistan again, and I lost control and I hit in the back of a lorry. Um, I have a picture for this as well, I mean, I've got a bandage over my head, uh, I broke my nose. So what actually happened, sorry, um, I fell asleep at the steering wheel. Okay. And I woke up once my head bounced off the steering wheel. No airbag, no seatbelt. Um, just didn't know what was happening. Just totally out of it. What's going on here? How's my car all of a sudden stopped? Must have also been very expensive with that insurance. It was a brand new car as well. <laughs> there was no insurance, no nothing. Uh, oh, so this was a car you had hired? It was a hired car. It okay. was definitely a hired car. So it was a very expensive uh, accident, should we say. So I had people, I mean, dragging me out of the car, literally dragging me out of the car. I, I couldn't hear anything. I didn't know what was going on. I thought, well, the car's just stopped. What's going on? I, did, I just couldn't make sense of anything until I actually... Is that because you were numb with all the drugs? I was very numb. I, I couldn't feel anything. I was deaf. I couldn't hear anything, definitely. Uh, but I couldn't feel anything at all mm -hmm. whatsoever until I got taken out of the car, put to the roadside on the motorway. The car stopped on both sides of the motorway. And I'm looking at the car now, and when I seen the state of the car, I thought, if that's what's happened to the car, what's happened to me? And I start, you know, touch my face, and I thought, no, I'm okay, until I could see blood. And when I seen blood, it hit me right, hold on, I'm really hurt here. I tried to get it up on walking, fell straight to the floor. Everybody's like, keeping me on the floor, you're hurt, you're hurt. I'm like, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I want to go home, I want to go home. They're like, you're not going nowhere, mate. <laughs> you know, you're in the middle of the motorway. And then tried to get him up again and I fell to the floor. Uh, just a numbness feeling and I passed out. I recall waking up on a stretcher in the ambulance. And that's when I was in pain. And I'm like, where are you taking me? What's going on? And they're like, calm down, calm down. And I think they gave me some sort of injection just to knock me out again. And then I woke up in the accident and emergency. And this is not an A&E uh, in the UK. This is an A&E in the middle of nowhere. So I wake up on the same stretcher. Stretch it against the wall, 15, 20 people, other patients, four or five doctors, nobody's around me. <clears throat> I've got one bandage over my head. Uh, I, I managed to sit up. Again, a numbness in my face, but pain all over my body. Um, and my lips are all swollen, a few scars on my head, uh, on my hand, sorry. So I went and looked at myself in the mirror, found myself a mirror, and utter disbelief. I couldn't believe it. My face had all swollen up. My lips were swelling, my teeth were red, my nose was actually bleeding while I was looking in the mirror. Yeah, and I thought, what's going on? You know, my nose was running. I mean, By that time thing, you were sober? Uh, well, I wouldn't know if I was sober or not, but I, was definitely, I definitely knew what was going on with myself. Um, I approached the nurse and I said, what's going on? She says, well, go lie down, we're waiting for your x-rays. And I says, well, I'm bleeding, I need to clean you up. What, you know? And they're like, well, we're waiting for your x-ray, we can't do nothing. I thought, we can't do that. Went and got some cotton wool, put it up my nose. Took the bandage off, rebandaged myself, got a mouthwash off uh, one of the nurses, washed my mouth, washed all the blood, all my lips were all cut up and everything. Got me x-rays, found out I had a broken nose, four fractured ribs, mm -hmm. my rib cage had been all pushed back, breathing difficulties, uh, shattered, uh, well, fractured collarbone, uh, spinal damage, nerve damage, <clears throat> and uh, I sat there for about four hours, and to the point I realised I'm not getting treated here. So I caught a taxi and I came home. Really? Got a taxi, came home. So how did you fix your nose then? It fixed itself. Okay. Because a typical addict, what I did was, came home, opened the bottle, took some drugs, and thought everything will heal. And that continued for two weeks, three weeks. So, And I just went to the pharmacy for medication and just got anything off the counter to ease the pain. Uh, and uh, it eventually it just did heal itself mm -hmm. over, I think it was three months it took to heal. And during this period, I informed my family, I told them what the score is. They're like, we need to get you on the plane. Again, typical addict. I'm okay, I'm fine, I'm coping, I'm not in no state to get on the plane. When I'm better, I will come. Um, so as I got better, they made two attempts to actually uh, get me back home and sent me two tickets. Again, I wanted to go, but my addiction and the people and the society and the lavish lifestyle, well, it wasn't lavish really, 
but that he just didn't allow me allow me to go. Indulgent lifestyle. Definitely. Until then the point came, rehabilitation. So how did you end up in rehabilitation? <laughs> or who took you there, should I say? Uh, you, you um, or did you check yourself in? I didn't want to check myself in. That was definitely not an option, so I didn't do that. Uh, rehabilitation came about, I think, uh, I was forced. It wasn't a good experience. Absolutely hated it. Um, I know it's a big issue now in Pakistan with rehabilitation, with the way people are treated in rehabilitation, the way they actually admitted rehabilitation. I mean, some people are that willingly go, excuse me, or go with their families, and there are some people like myself who actually got drugged uh, and taken. So I was in my family home, um, family contacted the rehabilitation centre, they assured them, okay, we will go there. I mean, I didn't know at that time, but now realising after I've come back what the process was, um, it just wasn't as they said it would be. My family was in England, they were in control, they just signed the papers for, uh, for, for me to be like They were just desperate to get some kind They of were help. definitely, they were definitely. So they were just reaching out to absolutely anybody and they reached out to this rehabilitation centre. So... Um, what they actually did was, um, I, I was at my relative's house in Pakistan, so they tried mixing some drugs into my food to knock me out. To, yeah, so I'm, I, I'm totally out of it. But it didn't happen. I didn't eat the food. And this is waiting outside for a couple of hours. I mean, found out this later, obviously. And uh, in, the, in the warm temperature, it was midnight as well. Uh, halfway in the middle of the night, all humidity and everything. I thought, right, so these six of them came barging in while I'm sat there, again, taking drugs. Uh, restrained me, tied my hands, tied my legs. There's me shouting and yelling, help, help, help. Um, and the relatives there watching? They just scattered. There was nobody there. Uh, and then stopped me from screaming. They put some uh, some cloth or something in my mouth, tied it up. And I really thought I'm being kidnapped. I was fearing my life. I thought, what the hell is going on here? Who are these people? Where have they come from? Uh, I felt a sharp needle going in my bum. Uh, and then next thing I know, I've just gone to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> And I've woken up in this rehabilitation centre, not knowing it was a rehabilitation then, obviously. So did you knock out straight away as soon as they put the needle in you? Uh, a short while. Yeah. A short while. It took a short while. Uh, because obviously I was fighting back and they were training, so there's a lot of uh, aggressive behaviour going on, shall we say. Uh, or very unpleasant behaviour. Mm -hmm. From their side, not my side, obviously. Obvi well, obviously. Uh, yeah. Obviously. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I woke up in the rehabilitation centre, tied um, again. And then they're taking blood samples, and while they're taking blood samples, while I'm tired, I'm freaking out. Where am I? Who are you? What's going on? And they're like, well, we know what you've been doing, and this and this. And it was really, really mentally uh, breaking me down, thinking, what the hell is going on here? I do not know where are these people, who are these people, where they come from, who's... You know, I want to talk to my family, where's my family? And they're like, well, you're not leaving here for a very, very long time. That initial entrance to the rehabilitation itself mm -hmm. had, I think, till today, has a big effect on... On, on, on me, definitely. Uh, I don't think it has an effect on the way I've rehabilitated, rehabilitated, but it has definitely scarred me. I think it was wrong uh, for rehabilitation. But so were that, they instrumental in rehabilitating you and getting you off the drugs? Now, that's a very difficult answer uh, to give yourself because if you ask me, I would say I rehabilitated myself. The only part I believe the rehabilitation centre had in rehabilitating me was giving me medicine and keeping me away from the drugs. That's it. I don't think there was any counselling involved, which there should have been. There was any psychological help. In fact, they actually damaged me and other patients more psychologically. Um, it's, it's worse than a prison, and I have been to prison. And in prison, at least you've got the freedom, you can go eat, I mean, you know what's going on, you know when you're leaving, you've got a timetable. In there, it was, it, it was chaos. Was it one of these uh, rehabilitation centres where I've certainly read about, where they chain you uh, throughout the day or...? I thought these were stories first. Yeah. Initially, I heard similar things as well, until I experienced... Uh, in three different events or three different times, I'd actually been tied to the bed for over 12 hours. Um, this was... But anybody else from the outside would probably have said that it was you were being tied for your own benefit. 80% of the people from the outside do not even know this. It's only when people like myself actually go out and tell them, 
I think I was tied down because they did not know how to handle me or how to deal with me or how to answer my questions. Had they been compliant with myself and saying, well, hold on a minute, you're in here for drug rehabilitation, you need help, your family is aware of this, and this is what's actually happening with you, you know, it gives us reason to calm down, but there is none of that. They don't, I mean, let me give you a typical example. If uh, I wanted to make a telephone call, every time I wanted to make a telephone call, I got tied up. And I'm like, I want a phone call. I want, right. I want to call my family. Let me call my family. Right, time up. And then I'm making noise and I'm kicking off. Well, time up. Well, come and tell me or let me make them speak to my family. The problem was they don't like to speak to your family because they're fearful and they're scared. Just in case this person now actually tells what's going on. And when it actually came to the point, this was three weeks now after I've been in rehabilitation, in the same clothes, nothing to wear. It was just mayhem. Uh, and uh, I got my first telephone call. So I got called to the office with the person who actually runs the organization and is like, you're gonna get one phone call, you're gonna get one chance. So you tell them everything's brilliant, treatment is brilliant, okay? Uh, everything's going perfectly fine, you're coping well, and we'll give you this phone call. And if you don't? If you say anything wrong, we will terminate the call. We'll tell your family he needs psychological help, is mentally ill, uh, drugs have had a real big mental uh, effect on him and you'll be here forever and there'll be no time scale until when you're going to leave. Now having that fear of not knowing when you're going to leave, you just want to comply with the rules. So is it, could you say there was commercial considerations being applied there because each uh, addict who's being sent there for rehabilitation is a bit of a cash cow for the centre? hundred percent, hundred percent. All black so it's not in their interest to be letting you go home early. They want to keep you in there as long as they can. As long as there can. was two patients in there, one was in there for eleven months. Yeah, uh, and there was another one in there for fourteen months. I was admitted for three months, and they kept me for six months. Wow. So was there any benefit of you? staying there i mean there must have been yes some. i made benefit of it myself alhamdulillah i got to the point where i thought well i don't know when i'm gonna leave i don't know what's going on with myself so let me recalculate my events what's happened with myself uh, i start praying five times a day i start doing this we i put all my reliance into allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and i thought if anybody is going to get me out of this place and anything is gonna, good is going to happen to me. Well, you had no choice. There was nobody else other than Allah. That's Allah. exactly that's exactly my point. There was yeah. nobody else for me to turn to except for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and I turned to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Now that was me. I tried turning another two, three people. I mean, all of them really. There was hardly any namaz being prayed there. Mm -hmm. I would leave Jamaat. I would wake up for Fajr prayer. Mm -hmm. uh, I would start reading Quran. Mm -hmm. I had patients reading with me. I, in fact, I was helping them deal with. Uh, being in there because I'd been there for six months so I knew how to cope with this now so I became a coping mechanism for them which actually uh, the staff people the staff and the organization didn't like I mean I'd have 15 16 people sat in my bedroom to be watching on the camera what's going on there going to Ijaz's room now he, they, there's an abuse outrage here and you know they're all gonna rebel against us and I'm like what's going on you know and so it was, it was so so after about six months you were sort of clean and off drugs and would you say that's when you were fully rehabilitated i believe i'd rehabilitated myself after approximately four months i was ready to go home yeah. uh, but there was just no way they'd let me go i was from the uk i was money i was a paycheck and who was paying for this my family was paying okay. for this so my family was paying for this um, did they not ever come to visit you Obviously not, they were in England. <laughs> so I had no visits. I usually had telephone calls or video calls. And that's the only thing I had. And any vid visits, um, there were very rare visits, if there were any visits. People were not allowed in the rehabilitation center itself. We were taken out of there, taken to the office, and then families would come there. Again, just blackmail. It was all blackmail. Behave, tell your family everything's going good. But Okay, what I want to learn, or for the benefit of our viewers, is to learn from you, is how can drug addicts like yourself, previous drug addicts like you, be helped? Because this is a question that many people no need, uh, we, we, without doubt, need to ask. They want to know. Because I know we had a relative who was uh, in Pakistan, addicted to drugs for a very long time. And the easiest thing for them to do is lock them up, beat them up, and try to deprive them of drugs. But over the last 20, 30 years, I know that has not worked. This person is still addicted to drugs. And I've heard of many other stories of addiction where people have not been able to free themselves of this addiction. 
and you alhamdulillah have so what advice would you give to addicts I think I think the first thing or we have families to, yeah addicts. I think the first thing we have to recognize and realize is that, that there's a cause mm. for somebody to become an addict depression anxiety some sort of event might have occurred in their life or anything associated but there's a trigger point there's always a trigger point mm. uh, it is key to actually go back and recognize what that trigger point was and address the issue. So you've got to go back in time and address that issue. What happens? The root causes. The root causes. I mean, that's what I did with myself and I helped people in the rehabilitation center to recognize why they were there and why these situations had occurred or events had occurred in their life. The problem we have is nobody recognizes that. And then we've got rehabilitation centers like this who come and pick you up, lock you up, beat you up, and write, you know, Trump, we're going to keep you clean. But what are you actually doing? You're actually causing more trauma for this person. You're not actually counseling this person. You're not helping this person realize where he'd actually gone wrong, what he'd done wrong. The people, the society, the environment, the causes, people have to be able to recognize these to actually make amends. If you don't recognize these, how are you going to actually make amends? You can't. It's impossible. It's just like a water leak in a pipe. If you don't know where the leak is, the pressure is not going to, you're not going to increase the pressure. You have to go find the leak, go back there, patch up the leak, and then try moving forward. Not until you've actually fixed up your past mentally in your head, you're not going to move on. And that's the problem. You see, it's not just the mental, uh, the past which is affecting people mentally, but maybe in that present moment there are situations which you are trying to numb yourself with drugs so you don't have to cope with them. So how do you deal with that, trying to give people, help people to cope with the situation that they may be uh, in at that moment in time that they can't cope with? It's difficult. It's very, very difficult. Um, at that time and at that situation, you just got to give them love and affection and make them feel special. That person at that time is vulnerable. Yeah. He's feeling down. He's yeah. feeling the bottom end of society, but yet trying to keep a face up front there. So you have to make him feel special. You have to give him that love. protection and that love. love. Yeah, definitely. He, he, yeah, love. And so you think giving love would benefit him? 100%. 100%. There was so much hatred in that rehabilitation center. While I was there, I'm still in contact with 25 patients. Out of 25, three of us, alhamdulillah, have been rehabilitated. Mm -hmm. And the other 22 are back on drugs. And 80% of the people who were actually there were saying, I can't wait to get out of here and have my other joint. I can't wait to get out of here and have a drink. All these people are my family. They were actually rebelling against their families because, they, the yes, put, because you've not put them in any better place. Yeah, 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 okay. Re these rehabilitations have to sort their act out and actually try rehabilitating and not look at all the money that's coming in. an aggressive strategy of trying to not work. up and probably beating them up or depriving them of is, is not necessarily going to work. It's never going to work. It will never, ever work. You are just giving them more ammunition to rebel and use drugs and go back there and, and rebel against you all again. It, it's hatred. You did this to me, now I'm going to do that to you. You tried sorting me out, but hold on a minute, now I'm going to sort you out. And the only way you can rebel against them is by taking more drugs. Well, Ajaz, it's been a, a great story from start to finish, and I know you've got some great plans going forward to the inshallah, future inshallah. of getting into the rehabilitation uh, yourself for other people, so help rehabilitate other drug addicts. And we don't want to talk about that now, inshallah, for another program. I want to invite you, once you're closer, because just for the benefit of our viewers, Ajaz is thinking of opening a rehabilitation center in Pakistan sure. to help the very sort of same addicts uh, who have been suffering like he had and rather than being going through a rehabilitation center where they're actually tying people up beating them up and not giving them the sort of counseling and therapy that they actually need he has a different model that he wants to sort of deploy to help uh, the addicts especially in Pakistan so we will be inshallah talking about that in more detail in a future Inshallah. podcast uh, program. But for today, Jazakallah for coming. May Allah bless you. Inshallah. And it truly is an inspiring story to hear from how you started with addiction to, you know, how you've recovered now. And you are now, you know, uh, trying to put back into society. Inshallah. And Inshallah. may Allah bless you and keep you protected. And uh, Jazakallah for watching. And uh, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Inshallah, we'll be bringing more programs and Inshallah, we'll be inviting Ajaz again to give us an update once that rehabilitation center is open because it certainly is a very, very interesting topic. 
and story to follow. May Allah bless you all and we shall speak to you again and see you soon. Allah Hafiz. Thank you.